Good evening. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about failure mechanisms. These are the processes that cause a product to break or to become less satisfactory or to become useless in some other way. And it's important that you understand not just the vocabulary, so how you describe these things accurately in English, but also what the processes are about, because these will help you um, in your career to design more reliable products and products that last for longer. So, what I've done for now is to um, categorize the failure mechanisms. There are five failure mechanisms which are much more common than the others, and these I like to think of as the big five of destruction. I'll go through these one by one, and then we'll look at a few examples of and failure mechanisms acting in succession. The first is wear. Now wear is the mechanical removal of material from the surface of a component, perhaps in a bearing surface, something like that. And essentially you get two kinds of wear. You get abrasive wear, which is a bit like what happens when I take a stick of chalk, and write on the board, if you then rub your hand against this, you can see that this consists of powder. And the chalk is, is crumbly, um, pieces are neatly breaking off the surface and getting stuck to the board. And this is um, what we think of as abrasive wear in engineering. And the other kind of common wear is adhesive wear. That's rather like what would happen if I took a wax crayon or a candle, I don't have one today, and drag that down the board instead. And that would then leave a trace that was smeared on the board. It was deformed rather than being broken into neat particles and it wouldn't easily come off. And you can see the same material um, in metals and plastics and many other materials. To show you a couple of examples, this is a brake disc from a van and you can see the silvery surface here is where the, com um, the composite um, brake pads have been squeezing the disc and gripping it to um, create a frictional force that then slows the vehicle down. And these need to be changed every few hundred thousand kilometers, something like that. And they have a minimum thickness. I think you can see it on here. It says 8.4, presumably 8.4 millimeters. So to be on the safe side, so that this doesn't break up into pieces when you break hard, then when it gets down to 8.4 millimeters, um, it needs to be swapped for a new one because of wear. Another thing that can um, suffer from wear in a very obvious way, a small wood cutting axe like this one. Over time, the steel gets worn off the cutting edge as you cut into the wood and the cutting edge gets deformed. You then have to take it to a grinding wheel and then grind the cutting surface to sharpen it again. Another example of wear. The second failure mechanism I look at is corrosion. Now, when metals are made for the first time, you take a, a piece of ore, this is magnetite, so a common type of iron ore, and you heat this up um, to um, cause this iron ore to then break down and form a pure metal. And you have to heat it up to add energy, um, because it's an endothermic reaction, it consumes energy. When you have your pure metal, it's then much stronger than the original ore. You couldn't take this and cut a, a sensible component out of it that was one millimeter thick. It would be far too brittle and weak. And this here, if you look at this, um, this bucket, um, this is made out of metal that's probably about a millimeter thick, and um, that's quite strong. But you can see at the bottom of the bucket here, um, the bucket has got a large tear in it. Now the reason for this tear is corrosion. And when you allow the chemical reaction um, to take place in the opposite direction, so when you allow a metal, a pure metal to turn back into a metal oxide, it releases energy. So it's something that it chemically wants to do all of the time. Now, usually the way this happens, is either uh, by heating the metal up to a very high temperature, 
and you'll find that things at a high temperature corrode in dry air. Or you'll find that um, when you put them in a damp environment, then wet corrosion can take place, where you have an electrical circuit with electrons flowing around and causing the corrosion um, process to take place at the anode of the circuit, and the cathode is then protected um, from corrosion by the, the flow of electrons onto that part. Now, what you can see has happened here is this, this bucket has probably been um, filled with uh, something damp, like uh, dead leaves, fallen leaves in the autumn, that kind of thing, and they've uh, kept the bottom damp, but um, also allowed a, a good supply of air to reach the bottom, and it's um, thinned the base so much um, that um, at some point when it's been loaded up with um, rocks or coal or something, then it's actually torn open. So here you can see two um, types of failure mechanism taking part um, at once, or taking part in succession, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. So corrosion means that um, a strong material is replaced by a weak material, which often flakes off, um, but it also has some other interesting characteristics. Um, these calipers here, which are presumably not made out of stainless steel, or they've been in quite an acidic and corrosive environment. Um, these um, calipers here, they're very stiff. They don't move easily um, because there's rust in the, the rack and pinion mechanism. And rust um, creates rough surfaces, but it's also um, bulkier. It takes up a larger volume than the metal it replaces. So it tends to seize things and jam them. You can often see on bridges where rust has taken place between um, two, two pieces of steel that are then bolted together in a joint, where rusting's taking place between them, then it often causes them to bulge. And that's called pack rust because um, the rust packing the joint has a larger volume and actually deforms the joint. It's also um, a bad conductor of electricity and rusting can cause um, all kinds of electrical joints um, to fail, especially if they're low voltage, so things like an earth clamp on a welding set um, or a starter motor on a car, battery terminals, that kind of thing, they can corrode. And it's a bad um, conductor of heat. You can see here, this isn't steel, so it doesn't rust, but it does con uh, corrode. And the bit of this large soldering iron, it's known as a soldering hammer because of its size, and this has corroded quite a lot. And in order to solder well with this, it would need to be cleaned off the layer of corrosion so that you get good thermal um, conduction to the tip. The third failure mechanism I mentioned is fatigue. Now, fatigue means that um, a component is subjected to a varying stress. In the worst case, a stress that completely reverses. So you have a high positive stress, and then it goes back through zero and a high negative stress. And this has the habit of causing cracks to grow slowly. And this is a bush from an excavator. It has a force of about 11 tons on the bush in operation. And you can see there's a, a groove around the center which allows the grease to be pumped in. And, but this has presumably ended up in bending somewhat. And over time, you've got a crack um, that's gone halfway around and then ended at the hole. Another thing that commonly suffers from fatigue, flexible cables. These headphones no longer work because here, where the cable um, goes into the headphone, um, it's been bent back and forth so much that you've had these um, alternating stresses, positive and negative, on the cores, the metal cores in the cable, and then you've ended up with an open circuit and the headphones don't work anymore. The next failure mechanism I'll mention is creep. Now, creep means that you load a component and very slowly over, over time, um, the stress causes it to change shape, but very slowly. So over a course of days or weeks or years, that kind of thing. And if you have a wooden bookcase and you put too many books on it, so that it's really heavily loaded, you might have noticed that over time, it starts out horizontal, and then it slowly turns into a boat shape. It sags down. And if you take off the books, 
it may not return to its original shape. In that case, it's changed shape, it's crept. It's been a result of this creep process. A related process is relaxation. That means that um, you take something and you deform it into a new shape and then you hold it in that shape and over time the stress in the material can reduce so that it takes up the new shape. This is a bit easier to demonstrate because I don't need a bookcase. Here you can see a fan belt from a car. This is brand new but it's been in its packet here for several years and you can see that it's now no longer round. It takes up this rabbit ear shape. It's not going back to its original shape because the material has relaxed. Now, in this case, it wouldn't be harmful, but it's an example of relaxation. The last of the big five is sudden damage. And this is often the final result of another process like wear or corrosion that removes material. And basically, um, something just goes bang or bends and you can see here part of a wheel disc from a car that's hit a curb. This is made of some kind of brittle plastic and it shatters, broken into pieces. You can see a similar thing here with this fancy glass dish. There's a piece missing out of the edge. And this is an example of um, this subcategory brittle fracture here. In that you're seeing brittle behavior. It's not deforming, it's not changing into a different shape. It's just cracking into pieces. In the second category is plastic deformation, which you'll no doubt have heard about. Now, when something is overloaded, then it deforms permanently into a new shape, but it does it suddenly, rather than the creep process, in which it happens slowly. And this is a handle from a drilling machine that fell a couple of meters onto the floor. And you can see um, the legs of the handle here are no longer vertical, but they're bent over to the side. However, it hasn't actually broken. It can still be used as a handle. So from the point of view of the engineer, you think of that as being a fairly good result. There's one last failure mechanism I'll mention here. And I think of this as being the outlier because it's not really a failure mechanism. Because it doesn't necessitate that the product actually breaks so that it no longer works. This is obsolescence. Now, obsolescence means that a product is no longer useful. Maybe people no longer want it, or it's no longer compatible with the other things that they have, or it no longer adheres to the regulations, that kind of thing, even though it still works. And here's an example of a computer mouse. I think this one was made by Digital Equipment Corporation sometime in the late 80s for a Unix workstation. It has a plug on here that um, is no longer compatible with any other computer. And although this probably still works, no one can use it. And you'll see a similar example with, say, a typewriter. And there are many, many typewriters out there in the world that still work just fine, but nobody wants them and people throw them away because people prefer to write their letters and send their emails and things on a computer instead of typing them on a sheet of paper and putting it in an envelope, sticking on a stamp and taking it to the post. Now, sometimes these failure mechanisms can occur in succession. To give you an example, um, here's an electric motor. And you can see here that um, it's burnt out. So the lacquer which insulates the copper wire has reached a temperature which is too high and it's become charred and it's no longer blocking the flow of electric current, probably two or 300 centigrade, something like that. Now, this happened because the pump itself was seized, probably due to corrosion, or because there was sand in the pump, something like that. But it can also happen if an oil lubricated bearing then leaks, so the bearing seal doesn't work, and the oil is then able to flow into the motor and coat the windings, which probably won't damage them in itself. Um, but if that then gets covered with dust, especially if you have a motor where the airflow goes through the motor. This one, it doesn't, it flows over the surface of the motor. And then the dust can create an insulating layer of gum, which then causes the temperature in the windings to rise and the motor to burn out. Another example would be a wind pump. Some of you may have seen wind pumps in um, the American Midwest or Africa where they irrigate fields. 
and this consists of a little wind turbine on top of a tower, some kind of a gearbox and a pump underground. Now, the gearbox is usually very simple, and instead of having seals um, in the case to stop the oil escaping, it has deflector plates, which um, are small pieces of sheet metal, which um, throw the oil back into the center of the gearbox and prevent it from getting near the joints and leaking out. Now, if you remove those deflector plates, which perhaps look small and unimportant, then the oil slowly leaks out of the pump, when there's no more oil, the wear increases, the gears gradually wear out, you'll probably find the teeth break off and the wind pump fails. I'll give you a couple more examples of less common mechanisms. There are many ways in which some materials can be degraded and turned into weaker things. Here you can see a caster from an office chair, and this is the rubber tire from the caster, which makes it um, run smoothly and quietly. And this is perished, so the rubber's become hard, and it's become no longer flexible or resilient, and it's cracked and fallen off, probably because um, you've got some kind of chemical change taking place in the rubber, like extra cross-links between the polymer chains. If you're interested in um, ma uh, material degradation and changes like perishing, take a look at um, the Challenger Space Shuttle disaster from 1986 which was caused by a loss of resilience in the rubber O-rings um, due to low temperatures. Here you can see another bit of material degradation in that you've got some sudden damage here. The end of the axe handle has broken off because this has been infested by woodworm, so little beetles which eat away the wood. And the last thing I'll show you here is um, the chuck from a big computer-controlled milling machine. Now, this has been thrown away because the milling cutter broke off and left its shaft inside the chuck and no one could get it out again because the manufacturer didn't think to put a hole in the back of the chuck that you could use to drive the broken shaft of the milling cutter out. So, a case of seizure and something where it would have been useful for the designer to think, how do I get a broken milling cutter out of the chuck? What I want you to do for your assignment this week is to take a look at the concepts um, that another student has created, so their first ideas um, for um, the prototype that they will then um, write their report about in the later stages of this course, and I want you to give them some constructive feedback in written form. So think of these uh, failure mechanisms here. and give them some feedback, say what might be a weakness in their um, design, um, what could they perhaps think about when it comes to the detailed design um, that they'd be looking at later in the course, and um, try to be constructive, don't be too critical, um, but try to think, well, what looks weak, what looks vulnerable, what looks like it's going to cause this product to break and be irreparable, or what looks like it will cause people to no longer want this product, what will make it become obsolescent. I'll upload a list of um, the names um, together with a partner so you know who you've got to swap with when it comes to your, your first ideas and giving this feedback about likely failure mechanisms. So I'll upload that to Stood IP. If you've got any questions, please let me know. Thank you.